I think a lot of us have um, kept the next presentation high on our list of things we're looking forward to seeing. I know I have. Um, I'd like to introduce Dr. Daniel Dineshvar, who received a BS from MIT and completed his MD, PhD at Boston University School of Medicine. He has over 40 publications studying the long-term effects of head impacts in athletes, including chronic traumatic encephalopathy, also known as CTE. And he's worked at Boston University CTE Center since 2009. His research, excuse me, his research focuses on identifying, I'm gonna have to switch over my page. Um, on identifying the relationship specifically between the exposure to repetitive head impacts and their effects on the development of CTE. He is a national expert, um, a leader in the field. We're very lucky to have him at Stanford and um, very lucky to hear his presentation on this very important topic. Daniel. Thank you, Dr. Lumber Brown, for that excellent introduction. I really appreciate it, and thank you and uh, to you and to Dr. Gajar for this amazing conference. It's so great to see so many people interested in traumatic brain injury, concussion, uh, and their long-term effects in one room. Um, people from all over the campus, from all over the country, and I think that these kinds of conferences, getting these uh, brilliant minds together, are the way we're going to ultimately be able to address some of these major issues and ultimately uh, cure these diseases. So that, that's great to see. At the outset, I wanted to, to properly frame the, this talk by um, telling you guys that for years, I had probably one of the worst jobs possible. Uh, you see, it was my job to find out whenever anyone died in this country uh, that played sports so that I could look up their next of kin's contact information and give them a call out of the blue. I hated making those calls. Um, but we had to do that to determine whether or not people were interested in brain donation so that we could find out the information that we have found out. So when we talk about things like that uh, we found CTE in 110 out of the first 111 NFL players we studied, uh, it's important to note, to remember, to not forget that every single one of those brains was a person who passed away uh, often too soon and always tragically. And it was a phone call that was made in a family that generously agreed to donate, and I don't want to lose sight of that. So let's talk about one of those individuals. This is Dave Dorson. Now, Dave was a larger-than-life person, really, at a younger age, the youngest of four kids growing up in Muncie, Indiana. He uh, was a standout athlete. Uh, but in addition to earning 10 varsity letters in high school and, uh, and doing very well uh, as an All-American athlete in high school, he also was in the National Honor Society, and he was constantly looking at what would happen after football for him. So he had his pick of the litter for uh, colleges to go to, including a lot of football powerhouses, but he chose to go to Notre Dame because he thought that uh, that would give him the best opportunities going forward. And in fact, he made the most of his time at Notre Dame uh, by interning for Senator Dick Luger and getting an econ degree in addition to being an All-American twice. So really an incredible athlete. He ended up going to the NFL, playing for about a decade, uh, 11 years total uh, for the Bears as a safety for the, uh, the Giants with the Cardinals. And uh, during that time, he was not only a great football player, winning a Super Bowl twice um, and uh, uh, being on the Pro Bowl three times, but uh, he was also just a great person to be around. He was the 1987 NFL Man of the Year as well. He played in the era before these, these folks made a whole lot of money, though, so after he retired, he ended up starting a couple of businesses, and at one point was actually worth $40 million. So did really well. He actually got an executive MBA from Harvard as well. Um, everything was, doing, was going quite, quite well for him until or his 30s or so. Uh, he started having problems with uh, his mid-late 30s, having problems with uh, his finances. He started making bad business decisions. He ended up actually declaring bankruptcy, but in addition to that, he started changing in terms of his personality. He uh, started becoming first physically abusive, sorry, first verbally abusive to his wife, ultimately physically abusive, and they became estranged. He was also verbally abusive to his, his kids. Ultimately, they got divorced, and things were kind of spiraling out of control. And unfortunately, um, around at the age of 50, he uh, wrote this note before uh, taking off all of his clothes and lying down in bed, pulling a sheet over his chest and shooting himself. So we'll talk in a little bit, I'll show you what we found in his brain after it came to us, but that's the, the, uh, the issue that he thought that he had, 
CTE. So let's, let's uh, back up and take a look at what he thought he had. So we've long posited that there's a relationship between head trauma and multiple neurodegenerative diseases. Um, Alzheimer's disease has been implicated with repetitive head impacts as well as Parkinson's disease and ALS. Now, the bulk of the uh, research su uh, supporting the link between these studies has been epidemiologic uh, research and not based on neuropathologic uh, analysis. So for all of these diseases, for example, for Alzheimer's disease, when someone's diagnosed with Alzheimer's in life, they're given a diagnosis of possible or probable Alzheimer's disease based on the presence of biomarkers. But the true diagnosis of the disease isn't made until someone passes away. And ultimately what we found, unfortunately, in our cohort is a lot of individuals diagnosed with these other diseases in life actually neuropathologically had CTE. So what is CTE? Well, CTE is not a new disease. It's been around uh, since the 1920s. It was first described in JAMA by Harrison Martland in 1928. And uh, it's had a lot of names over the, those 90 plus years. It's been called dementia pugilistica, being punch drunk. Um, and in the 60s, it took on the name chronic traumatic encephalopathy, or CTE for short. Uh, but for, as of 2008, so uh, really the 80 years after Harrison Martland described CTE, uh, there are only 45 cases in the global literature of uh, reported chronic traumatic encephalopathy. The vast majority of these cases of uh, CTE were in boxers, and that's, that makes sense because this was considered the dementia of pugilis, dementia pugilistica. Um, but what you can see here is your brain doesn't care what hits it. So if you're at risk, if you're uh, experiencing repetitive hits to the head, you're at risk of developing CTE. And that's why CTE, even before uh, 2008, had been found in other individuals, uh, victims of domestic violence, in military vets. Uh, famously, actually, in the literature, uh, there was a circus clown that was repetitively shot out of a cannon who developed CT. Again, your brain doesn't care how it's getting hit. If you're getting hit in the head repetitively, you're at risk of developing this disease. So there are 45 cases in the first 80 years of CTE, and we started our center in 2009. And uh, for the current status of the brain bank, we have over 700 brains of individuals who had uh, exposure to repetitive head impacts, 732 as of this morning. Um, who were exposed to repetitive head impacts and who've been neuropathologically evaluated or are undergoing an evaluation if it's not complete yet. We published the first 85 donors to our brain bank in uh, the journal Brain in 2013. Of those, 67 had CTE. And we published the first 202 football players who donated their uh, brains to us in JAMA in 2017. 177 of them had CTE. And uh, 246, so a l another 40 or so uh, football players in annals of neurology a little later, uh, 211 of whom had CTE. All right, so what is this disease? Uh, let's, uh, I promise I'm not going to do too much uh, of, uh, the, at the cellular level, but let's take a look at uh, a, a cartoon of a neuron here. So to orient you, you have your uh, dendrites on the left, the soma, the axon in the middle, and then the, the synapse on the right. So you have your electrical signal being converted down into a chemical signal and being transmitted into other cells. But something about the concussions, as we've been talking about all day today, that mechanical or, or stretch injury causes disruption of the uh, cell membrane, and you end up having a massive efflux of potassium from the cell and influx of calcium causing unregulated depolarization. Now, when that happens, you have a, a, a deficit of, uh, of um, metabolites, and as a result, you have uh, what we believe are the symptoms of a concussion. Now, uh, it can, in, in the vast, vast majority of ca cases, as we learned earlier multiple times today, concussions resolve spontaneously, and especially with rest. So it can take many days, uh, rest from contact, I mean. It can take many days for, uh, for the symptoms to resolve, and all, but ultimately, we expect concussions to return back to normal. But the key point here, and what I want to distinguish, is that concussions are not necessarily the same as CTE, not necessarily related to CTE. A concussion is a hit to the head that results in symptoms. So I can get a 50G impact to the head, and Dr. Gujar can get a 50G impact to the head, and they're the exact same hits to the head. And I have symptoms and he doesn't, I had a concussion he didn't. But it stands to reason that if that those hits continue to happen over years, the asymptomatic hits might still have long-term sequelae associated with them. And uh, that's, in fact, what multiple studies have found even uh, outside of the realm of CTE. So uh, there are, in, in, say, a given football season, there can be 1,000, upwards of 1,500 uh, of these asymptomatic hits that occur to a single athlete over a season. And when you aggregate that over seasons, it makes sense that that might have some problems associated with it. And in fact, there are some of those problems associated even in the near term. So there have been deficits shown on neuropsychological testing um, associated with uh, more hits to the head 
based on helmet sensor data. Uh, there's also been changes in functional and structural imaging uh, associated with these hits to the head. Well, so CTE, though, is a process that happens much later on a much different time scale than all of these. It happens decades later. So something about those repetitive hits to the head is causing problems pathologically that we're seeing later. What does that look like? Well, so in the top left, you see your neuron, and the axon there is cut and blown up in, in, the, uh, in the middle of a single microtubule. And so if you think of that beautiful, complex structure of the neuron, it's supported by the scaffolding, which is the microtubules. They're responsible for not only supporting the structure of the neuron, but also for transporting nutrients and, and uh, neurometabolites and, breakdown, and the breakdown products from different parts of the cell. So, the tau, so the, there's a big microtubule in the middle there, and the microtubules are stabilized by those little purple strands. Those purple stand, strands represent tau. Tau occurs in all of your neurons, and it's a normal thing, responsible for stabilizing the support system of that scaffolding. Something happens in multiple neurodegenerative diseases where that tau changes. It ends up getting a large phos uh, ph uh, phosphate group attached to it, becomes becomes phosphorylated, and changes in conformation. When that happens, it falls out of the structure of the microtubules and can no longer support that structure. So what does that mean for the neuron? Well, the, if it's no longer supporting the microtubule, microtubule degrades and ultimately you have cell death. But the interesting thing is abnormal tau, this p tau, can in, induce neighboring normal tau to become phosphorylated and to aggregate as well. So you can have this snowball-like process where a, a, a foci of abnormal p tau induces neighboring nor, a normal tau to aggregate and ends up uh, destroying the entire microtubule structure of that neuron. The other interesting thing is in vitro, it's been shown that this effect of p tau can transfer across cell membranes. So you can have abnormal p tau, these aggregates in one cell, crossing cell membranes and going to adjacent neurons and causing, again, an even bigger snowball-like process. And that's why we believe multiple neurodegenerative diseases are progressive in nature. We end up seeing more tau, uh, more p tau later in, in life. And that's, in fact, what's happening in CTE, is that CTE is a, is a disease that's characterized by a specific pattern of p tau. Well, what is that pattern? So this is the brain of a 65-year-old gentleman who donated their brain to the Framingham Heart Study. Uh, the brain is co-stained so that the uh, cells, uh, the neurons show up as this purple color, um, and that uh, if there was any of that abnormal p tau, it would show up as brown. And what you can see is just even from the, the gross brain tissue, there's no, there's no brown. And similarly, microscopically, there isn't any, any uh, p tau. And there shouldn't be any p tau in the normal brain of a normal person. In fact, we have uh, the brains from the Framingham Heart Study in our brain bank, and we don't see this in normal uh, individuals. This is an age-matched uh, individual, 65 years old, played in the NFL for a little over a decade. So what you can see, you don't need a microscope to see that there's a whole lot of p tau here. <coughs> and it's, folk, uh, the, the, it's localized primarily the medial temporal lobe there, the medial hippocampus, and also the depths of the sulci. And, uh, and when you look microscopically, you can see that the brain is riddled with, uh, with p tau, and uh, it is more focused around blood vessels. And that's actually what we'll talk about a little later as the pathognomonic lesion of CTE. Oh, did I lose my, I've been cut off. There we go, okay. Um, but it's not just uh, limited to uh, the forebrain. It, it also goes uh, into the, the uh, uh, brainstem and cord as well. So you have the midbrain with the substantia nigra. And I was talking earlier about the fact that a lot of the folks that came to us had other diagnoses in life, like Parkinson's disease. It makes sense that in some subset of our folks, we see a lot of p tau in the substantia nigra, one of the regions implicated with Parkinson's disease, but we're not seeing alpha-synuclein, Lewy bodies, any other, or amyloid, we're not seeing any other proteins associated with other neurodegenerative diseases. And it, it also goes then uh, into the, in some cases, into the cord as well. So we ended up coming together and defining the pathognomonic lesion of CTE being that paravascular deposition of tau, meaning tau that's predominant around blood vessels. And we published that in 2013. And then uh, we end up getting a program project grant uh, from uh, the NIH uh, to basically prove it. So the NIH identified uh, the le world's leading tauopathists. Uh, we had 25 cases of different, every tauopathy 
uh, possible from you know Alzheimer's disease and CTE uh, all the way to the um, uh, Guamania, Parkinson's dementia complex of Guam, right? So it's, you know, we, we had everything associated with Tau, and we, and we sent them the diagnostic criteria for those other diseases and for CTE. And they were blinded to everything, including age of the decedent, which they hated. They didn't, I mean, if, you, if you've ever worked with pathologists or, you know, radiologists, they, they're doctors. They want to have some clinical information too. But we didn't give them anything. And we asked them, based on these criteria, what they, um, what they found. And uh, there was a kappa of 0 0.78, which is a remarkable, remarkably uh, a substantial agreement between them on the diagnosis of these different diseases based only on those criteria that we proposed in 2013. Well, so then we actually flew them all to Boston and we had them come in for these, there's a great conference, we had like four of these microscopes and we had them debate what the criteria should be and they ended up coming up with more refined criteria, again, based on the fact that the pathognomonic lesion of CTE is the pair of ASCO deposition of tau. They all agreed on that, and they ended up coming up with some supporting features and, and changing some things in the margin. And at, th at this point, so once, once this was published, there's no longer any question. CTE is a distinct neurodegenerative disease that's characteristic and identifiable, and you can, in fact, diagnose CTE pathologically in the presence of other diseases as well. So you can say someone has Alzheimer's and CTE pathology because they have some of the Alzheimer's-like lesions and some of the CTE-like lesions. Well, so then in that same 2013 paper, we also proposed some stages of CTE. Now, these stages are a little uh, different because um, we basically noticed these patterns and we tried to clump cases into the similar types of patterns. What we found is there's these stage one type patterns of CTE where you had one or two foci of perivascular tau. The, these folks ended up, uh, after we, we, we found out that they ended up dying around age 44 on average with a standard eve of about 20. So they're a little younger than the rest of our cohort. Our stage two goes from one to two foci of uh, p-tau, uh, perivascular p-tau to multiple foci within a, a given slide. And this is where you start to see uh, the, at the, the folds of the brain or the depths of the sulci predominance of CTE in, in those regions, which is one of the supportive criteria for CTE. By stage three, you end up having not only those perivascular and depths, sulcal depths, uh, p-tau, but you also have involvement in the medial temporal lobe. And that, and that actually seems to predominate on, on the clinical, in the uh, pathologic picture. And this, unfortunately, is what Dave Duerson had. So this is Dave Duerson's brain. He had stage three CTE, and you can see that the nerve fibrillary tangles are focused around the blood vessels. And then stage four is where you have a massive widespread atrophy. So these are two separate cases, and the top case actually might not look that different than uh, the, the, the stage three case, except you can note that there's a lot more atrophy even in the, in the gross setting, and especially in uh, when you look in their slides. Um, there's been a lot of cell death and clearance of the PTAU. Uh, and then, of course, you have white a lot of white matter involvement in the lower case. So just massive, massive uh, uh, degeneration. So how does this look different than, say, Alzheimer's disease, the most common disease associated with uh, PTAU? Well, th these are brains that are co-stained for, uh, in, br in brown again for tau, for PTAU, and in red for, sorry, this one's actually just red for um, amyloid. So Alzheimer's is associated with two proteins, P-tau and amyloid. And, uh, and so the case on the left is a CTE case from our, uh, from our brain bank that uh, has some amyloid in it. But again, you'd have to pull out the microscope to really see there are a couple sporadic areas that has some amyloid. So while, so, while you know, about half of our cases of CT have amyloid in them, that's the amount of amyloid we're talking about. It's very different than the amount of amyloid in an Alzheimer's case on the right. And then if you co-stain, so these cases are co-stained in red for amyloid and brown for tau. A normal brain has neither. A CTE case has only the p-tau. And the Alzheimer's has p-tau and amyloid. Interestingly, you can even see in this section, though, that the distribution of the p-tau is more diffuse in CTE, whereas it tends to be laminar or bilaminar, depending on the region of the brain you're in, for Alzheimer's disease. So this, this doesn't show the pathognomonic lesion of CTE. It doesn't show uh, uh, the p-tau around a blood vessel here. But you can still see that the distribution of the p-tau is different in these cases. Well, so each of our cases are snapshots in time. 
We don't know that an individual stage one disease would have progressed to two, to two, to three, or to four because they passed away. But what we can say is that the clinical symptoms appear to be slowly progressive over time when we talk to the families of individuals with CTE. You know, the symptoms started out insidiously, they had some memory impairment, uh, they might have had some behavioral dysregulation, emotional ability, and then that got worse with time until death. So the symptoms certainly sound, appear to be progressive. And interestingly, there's a significant difference in the time at death between these stages. So our pathologists, when they're staging all of this, they, our pathologists are completely blinded to the clinical history of the decedent. They don't know whether they're getting a person from our CTE, uh, sorry, from NFL, a military vet, a young suicide. They have no idea. And they're staging these cases, and there's a statistically significant difference between the, indiv the individuals that die at different stages, that are staged at different stages of disease, with about a decade between each stage. So again, we don't know that someone with stage one disease would have progressed to two or three to four, but there is a difference in their age with time. Now the symptoms get a little tricky then, because we can diagnose the pathology, it's there. But knowing how that pathology relates to symptoms is a big question. It's hard to say. And that's actually about one third of my dissertation was focused on trying to figure that out. So what we can say is these are the constellation of symptoms that predominate with different stages of the disease. So stage one has headaches, issues related to attention and concentration. Well, for those of you, I mean, we've been here all day, sounds a lot like concussion, right? I mean, a lot of people get headaches. Some people have had issues with attention and concentration. For me personally, I, I find it hard to believe that the one or two foci of PTAU that we're seeing are necessarily related to this uh, these symptoms that we're observing in early stage disease. Similarly, in stage two disease, you're getting a little more pathology, but still, it may not be related to that pathology. There could be other factors related to the repetitive head impacts besides the PTAU, besides the CTE, that's causing the symptoms that were, observe that were observed in these individuals while they were alive. In stage two, you end up getting some depression, explosivity, short-term memory impairment. Stage three, that's where you start to have more cognitive deficits the, that are predominant, so executive dysfunction, um, and, uh, and other problems with executive functioning. And stage four, uh, you have massive uh, problems with cognition and, uh, and about uh, 80 to 90% of our, our cohort ends up with dementia. So uh, deficits in functioning that are significant enough to impair their ability to perform activities of daily living. So what do we see then? Well, when we're talking about symptoms at stage, you're significantly more like, likely to have cognitive symptoms and dementia with advanced stage. Interestingly enough, there's no difference in the prevalence of behavior and mood symptoms. But I think that that's largely because the most of our cohort is reporting behavior and mood symptoms. So in the stage with the lowest, stage two, stage one, sorry, stage one disease had the lowest prevalence of behavior and mood symptoms in that cohort, and still 88% of them had reported these symptoms. So all of the, it's very hard to find statistically significant differences when everybody's reporting these problems. Uh, there's a significant association between the highest level of play and the duration of play with the stage of disease. Uh, but there's no differences based on concussion number, there's no differences based on age of first exposure, and there's no differences based on position. So I wanna focus on this concussion number question for a second because there's no relationship between CTE severity and likelihood of developing CTE and number of concussions that someone sustained in their life. Well, what does that mean? So as I see it, there are two possible explanations for this. The first explanation is that we're really bad at diagnosing concussions and we're better now, but we were even worse 10 years ago or 20 years ago or 40 years ago. So it's entirely reasonable that we just have really bad numbers on the number of concussions someone passed away, especially when we're not asking the person directly, how many concussions did you experience? And we can read them a definition and figure out how many concussions they had. But we're asking their loved ones, as best as you can remember, based on this definition of a concussion, how many concussions do you think your loved one had? Sometimes the loved ones are their adult children who were never even around when they were playing in the NFL or in college football. So our concussion number might be really bad. But the other explanation, which is the explanation I happen to believe, is that Concussions aren't necessary for the pathogenesis of CTE. So we haven't found in our brain bank a, a, a case where an individual suffered a single concussion and developed CTE. Every individual who developed CTE had some history of repetitive head impacts over years. 
And so it's entirely reasonable, I think, to, that those sub-concussive hits that I was alluding to earlier, those hits that I was getting where I didn't have any symptoms, if they accumulate over years to the tune of thousands a year, that those have problems later in life, that those are, were, were responsible for the pathogenesis of the disease. But again, we don't know for sure. So CTE can only at this time be diagnosed after someone passes away. But what might that look like in someone who's alive? So this is Gene Atkins. Uh, Gene uh, was a safety in the NFL from uh, 1987 to 1996. Uh, he played for multiple uh, teams, including the Saints and the Dolphins. Um, he was known as one of the hardest hitting safeties in the NFL. And uh, unfortunately, around the age 40, he started having some, some problems, actually a little earlier than 40. But at age 43, he ended up coming into Boston and, uh, and seeing us. So while we can't diagnose CTE in life at this point, uh, there, there clearly are problems in a number of these individuals. So what we want to do, that's the holy grail, is trying to diagnose the disease in life. Because if we can diagnose CTE when people are alive, that's how we can get a cohort together to start evaluating treatments and ultimately work towards a cure. So we wanted to figure out what does CTE look like in life. And what we did is uh, we looked at our early cohort, just 36 individuals with pure CTE, no other pathology. What do they look like? And uh, the majority of these individuals played football. Um, and the rest also had some other contact sport uh, participation. But these were just the first 36 pure CTE cases we looked at. And what we found was two different phenotypes of CTE. We found that there were people who tended to present with behavioral and mood symptoms initially, and people who tended to present with cognitive symptoms initially. Now, when we looked at them, based on those two different presentations, the initial symptoms that they presented with, not the symptoms they ended up with because most people, almost everybody had behavioral mood symptoms and a lot of them had cognitive symptoms too. But based on the symptoms they initially presented with, the data stratified into two different cohorts. There was a cohort that presented younger, 30, average of age 35, and a, a cohort that presented older, average age of about 60. Now, the one interesting thing is when we dove back, after we published, and, you know, a couple, like a year later, uh, we were just looking through the literature for a review article, we realized that someone in the 70s actually proposed these two different presentations of CTE. And like a lot of things in medicine, we just forgot it and we're relearning it now. So this is something that's interesting and it's preliminary, but there could be different presentations of the disease, much like there are different presentations for concussion. Well, what else do we know? Uh, one other question we're asked is, how early is too early to start in these contact and collision sports? Well, what we looked at was, in, in two studies, uh, we looked at a study of individuals while they were alive, and we found that uh, earlier, playing football before the age of 12 was associated with earlier onset of self-reported cognitive and, behavior and mood symptoms. But those individuals, again, we don't know if they had CTE or not, so it's messy data. We wanted to look in our cohort with CTE. So we pulled 246 football players, the first 246 football players who donated to our center. Um, 211 had CTE and 126 of those had no comorbid diseases. And we found that the age of first exposure was not associated with the likelihood of developing CTE or the severity of the pathology when they had CTE. But individuals who started playing earlier had earlier cognitive symptoms and earlier behavior and mood symptoms as reported by their loved ones. Remember, this is a different cohort than the in-life cohort. We found the exact same thing. When we were asked them themselves, they self-reported earlier onset of symptoms. When they died, their families, different cohort, families reported that they had earlier onset of symptoms. But there's no difference in the amount of pathology in their brains, controlling for the age of death and controlling for the total years that they played. Also, yeah, the cognitive uh, symptom onset earlier. So how do we reconcile that? Well, and, and we eliminate the people without pathology that's the same as well, well, other pathology besides CT, found the same thing. So the way that I wrap my head around this, and again, this might not be accurate, is that there's this idea in neurodegenerative diseases called cognitive reserve. And the way it works is that individuals with high cognitive reserve are seen as it's like a, a, a marker for resilience of the brain. So your brain is able to map around areas of pathology, route around them, and you're able to compensate. Well, 
and, and the way this manifests is, for example, if you have two people, one with normal cognitive reserve, as time goes on and the, the pathology continues to progress in, say, Alzheimer's disease, it's well documented that they continue to, to progress, get worse. But in some, with someone with high cognitive reserve, as time goes on and the pathology gets worse, they're actually more or less the same. Not much changes until you hit an inflection point where the pathology gets severe enough that they're no longer able to compensate for it, and then they have a much more serious and severe decline. That's the idea of cognitive reserve. And the thought here is that age of first exposure might be a indicator, an inverse indicator of cognitive reserve. Basically, if you're hitting a brain repetitively at a young age when you're uh, responsible for axonal pruning and all, a, a, a host of other uh, developmental factors, that you're interfering with the ability of that cognitive reserve to form. And so that's, uh, that's at least our theory of what's going on. All right, and as I mentioned multiple times, we can only diagnose a CTE when it passes away, and we're working on trying to figure out how to diagnose it in life. So we published a paper um, last year uh, where we looked at CSF levels of a protein called CCL11, and we found that CCL11 levels in the CSF were higher in individuals that had CTE. Now, the beauty of CSF is we can undergo a spinal tap relatively easily, and that'll give us direct information, potentially, of whether or not someone has CTE. Now, this is a preliminary analysis, but it's something that's promising. Uh, and just la uh, two weeks ago, uh, my colleagues in Boston published a, uh, a paper in the New England Journal where they reported their findings in PET imaging. So there have been seven su studies looking at about 75 subjects, um, and the most recent one was a study looking at 26 former NFL players and uh, about 30 controls. And these NFL players all had behavioral mood and cognitive symptoms, all three, because we wanted to make sure that everybody in that cohort was at the highest risk of having CTE. So they all played for at least 15 years. They all had symptoms in every domain and so potentially associated with CTE. And we compared them to people, so con controls who had no contact sport exposure. And what we found is we using a marker that was uh, created for diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease called uh, flotazapir. It's specifically supposed to bind to tau in the brain. We were able to find that our NFL cohort had significantly higher flotazapir uptake in regions of the brain associated with CTE than the controls did. But on top of that, because a lot of diseases have tau, most commonly Alzheimer's disease, we wanted to make sure that what if these folks just had Alzheimer's disease? So on top of that then, my, my colleagues uh, used uh, flobetapir, which is a specific marker for a amyloid, or A-beta, to see if these brains lit up with A-beta, and they didn't. Only one of the NFL players had a beta uptake. The rest of them only had tau uptake in regions of the brain associated with CTE. Interestingly here, there was no relationship between the total tau, the flotals appear uptake, and their performance on neuropsychological testing. Now, this was limited just to the, all of these individuals had significant reports of cognitive problems, of behavioral problems, of mood problems. So I think the problem is that there's just too narrow a band. But there was a direct relationship between the total flotazapir uptake and the total number of years of play that these guys played. All right. And then there's uh, questions of how common CTE is. So this was another third of my dissertation, trying to figure this part out. And as, uh, as I reported earlier, we found CT in the first 110 of 111 NFL players in our cohort. And uh, some folks, uh, some uh, epidemiologists published separately in uh, neurology an analysis of our report uh, and found that that represents 10% of all NFL players who died during our study window, meaning that if every person who played in the NFL and died whose brain was not studied by us if they were all 100% clean, had no CTE, then the minimum prevalence at death in C of CTE in NFL players is 10%. Which is a remarkable statement because 
the Alzheimer's disease centers, the, the 31 federally funded Alzheimer's disease centers, so 29 or 31 regardless, the uh, uh, federally funded Alzheimer's disease centers, they have about a sensitivity of somewhere around 80%, 85%, and a specificity of about 75% in the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease of individuals who've come in to their center for multiple study visits oftentimes when they're diagnosing Alzheimer's disease pre-mortem and then when it goes to pathologic analysis. So that assumption, the 10% assumption, is assuming that the lay families of our donors are better at diagnosing CTE distinct from other neurodegenerative diseases than neurologists and experts who study this for a living and are performing neuropsychological tests with the person in front of them. Doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Okay, but maybe CTE is really common pathologically. Well, so there was a Mayo study where they looked at, that they had 2,000 uh, neurodegenerative disease brain donors and they went through their database and they found 66 of them that had, four, that had a, a history of contact inclusion sports. And so they wanted to look at their brains compared to some controls. And so they got some age match controls, 198 neurodegenerative disease controls without a history of contact inclusion sports play compared to neurodegenerative disease cohort uh, folks with contact and inclusion sports. And they found that 21 of the 66 player athletes across all these contact inclusion sports had evidence of CTE, but there was no CTE in any of the controls. This is not a disease that happens in the population. It's a disease associated with repetitive hits to the head. Uh, the majority of their, their folks with CTE of the 21, 11 of them played uh, football. Um, one of those 11 were at the professional level, the rest were high school and college level. Um, and, uh, and of course there was a smattering of high school and collegiate level uh, contact inclusion sports athletes that did not play professionally in, uh, amongst the folks that did not have CTE. Okay, and last month there was a study uh, out of uh, Europe where they had a, uh, a population of a uh, sample of folks who, um, just a community-based sample of individuals who were recruited for a different study, cohort population whose brains were donated, and they analyzed them for the pres presence of CTE. There are 310 people in this community-based population, and in them, none of them had CTE. Again, this is not something that's happening to regular people. So what do we know overall? We know at this time, CT can only be definitively diagnosed post-mortem, although we have some really interesting, promising things in the horizon. And we know that nearly every individual ever diagnosed with CTE has had some history of repetitive head impacts, not single TBI. And those head impacts, again, your brain doesn't care what hits it. That can be from sports, it can be from occupation, it can be from other sources. We don't know what the clinical presentation of CTE is, and we don't know, again, how to diagnose it in life, but we're working on it. This is a huge team. This is only some of the, the group. Um, this is actually probably about five years old now, so there's even new, newer people who are uh, doing a lot more work uh, than even I did. And uh, with that, I don't think I have time for questions, but if I do, I'd be happy to take some. I do? Yeah. Please. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So we found CT. There's a whole lot fewer um, cases of CT diagnosed in women, uh, but uh, victims of domestic violence have been diagnosed with CT, as well as I think two uh, women who uh, had uh, epilepsy and had repetitive head banging, where they'd hit their head against objects. They were diagnosed with CT as well. Um, but uh, it hasn't been found in our cohort in any contact sports athletes uh, that we've announced yet. What are the other arguments uh, besides um, the fact that CT may be present in the general population that people that are detractors of uh, mm -hmm. appreciation have? Yeah, so th there are, as I see it, two legitimate scientific criticisms of the science of CTE. But I think that people overstate those two criticisms because they're in effect directly contradictory. What I mean is this, our cohort is biased. We say that in the abstract of most of our papers and certainly in the body of all of our papers. What I mean is you're much more likely to donate your brain 
if you think that your loved one has problems, right? And so, you know, the numbers that we're seeing, for example, the 99% of CT and NFL players, that might represent that, you know, these people had really bad uh, symptoms, their loved ones are really concerned, and that's why they're donated to us, but it doesn't reflect what's going on in the real population. Or to a lesser extent, let's talk about the, the number of college players, right, that we found it in. So that certainly is a legitimate criticism. And the other criticism is that we don't know what the, the, the uh, uh, pathology of CT, how it's related to clinical symptoms, right? There could be pathology that's not related to clinical symptoms, and in fact, I think that that's the case for stage one and possibly some of stage two cases. So that's also a very legitimate criticism. I mean, I find it really hard to believe when we're talking about stage four disease and the brain is about 30% smaller than it should be and there's massive uh, axonal degeneration, that that's not related to symptoms, but people try to argue that as well. But here's the thing, and this is why I think this is a, the, the CTE skeptics paradox, is either the symptoms are so severe that families are able to identify it and preferentially donate to us, or there's no symptoms and the 99% we're seeing in the NFL represents the true prevalence of the disease in the NFL. But you can't have both of them at the same time. And people argue both at the same time. It doesn't make any sense. So I think that those are the major criticisms of the research to date. The criticisms have been kind of a moving target, though, unfortunately. Um, early on, it was that CTE isn't its own disease. It's not later, it's CTE is not associated with repetitive hits to the head. Now it's CTE is not associated with clinical symptoms. These criticisms are, are not really, I think that there's some, val there's some truth, there's a kernel of truth behind each of these, but, uh, but they're being overstated, I think. Yeah, uh, you, your study's based on American football. How about uh, soccer, football, uh, worldwide? Yeah, so we've uh, mostly focused on football in, in the U.S. because there's more cases of football. But you're absolutely right that Football players are not the only people, as we talked about today with concussion, they're not the only people associated, uh, that are exposed to concussion. They're certainly not the only people associated with repetitive head impacts. Yeah, there's, so, there's somebody said once there's a, a lifetime limit to four to 7,000 headers. So I, I don't think we have any data about any hard numbers. Uh, I'd, love, I'd love if that were true. What we do have is epidemiologic studies that show, so what I can say, in, in our cohort, we found individuals who were diagnosed, say, with L ALS that didn't have ALS. Um, and then instead had CTE. In European uh, uh, football, so in soccer players, there's been a four times higher incidence of ALS in professional soccer players than in the lay population. So is it possible that's a misdiagnosed CTE? It's possible. There also could be a link between these head impacts and ALS as well. No, I wouldn't discount that either. But so there are, there's some evidence that these other sports are associated with, with CTE. Uh, we've also found CTE in soccer players in the, uh, as well as in Aussie rules uh, football players as well. I think one of the most worry, uh, worrisome results you talked about was the fact that this misfold of tau might be progressive, so uh, prionic disease. Right. Um, been criticized by a lot of people that you have to care if that's really soft science. Is that soft science or is that pretty hard science? It's, it's still pretty preliminary. Um, there is some promising evidence that indicates that there's some prion-like behavior of PTAU and also prion-like disease, uh, but prion disease associated with repetitive head impacts. But I, I think it's pretty early to be able to make any, any big statements about that, and I, I certainly wouldn't. Did you earlier state that there were cases of Parkinsonism that manifested only with PTAU depositions with acinucleon? That's correct, 100% sure. So it's thought to be CT Parkinsonism. It's uh, no other manifestations in the brain, just in the substantia nigra? Oh, no, sorry. So uh, I, I, I must have misspoke. Uh, so they had Parkinsonism. Right. They were diagnosed as Parkinson's disease or Lewy body dementia, depending on the, the, the case. Right. Um, but they did have other symptoms, behavioral changes, cognitive changes as well. Okay. So it wasn't just the, the motor changes of Parkinsonism that were observed in those individuals. And is there a particular predilection for the spinal lobe and mesial temporal lobe? So there isn't. Uh, and, and in fact, actually, there, there may be a predilection to substantia nigra, but even then, uh, it tends to be a little, it, it, the, the distribution of tau, really, of tau really varies from case to case. And I think that that indicates why some individuals have such a profound Parkinson, Parkinsonism and, and other individuals have no motor deficits at all. Uh, thank you guys.